So joining us today is Dr. Christopher Wynn, the CEO and co-founder of Itematic, which is powering the industrial economy by combining domain knowledge with AI to deploy AI to everything from farm to table sustainability, efficient equipment operations, and reduced energy consumption. He has an accomplished career ranging from building the first flash memory transistors at Intel to development of Google Apps as its first engineering director to leading AI engineering teams across Panasonic's global footprint. And today he is a vocal proponent of the emerging field of AI engineering and a thought leader in the space of ethical and human centric AI. And he is joined by Rashawn, who is head of product at Itematic. Thank you guys. Thank you. Okay, you can go. Okay. I don't think I need to stand there, correct? No, you can just sit down. Oh, I'm supposed to sit down. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I just got here. <laughs> um, this, sorry, this screen is not showing. I... Oh, there it goes. You, all right, cool. Okay, so who's heard of ChatGPT? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna skip this slide. Uh, who has used ChatGPT? Okay, folks who have not used ChatGPT, please leave the room. Uh, in your companies or, or research labs, have you taken a look at who is using ChatGPT or tools like that? but let's say ChatGP in particular, um, to increase their productivity the most? Like, I, as a CEO, I think about this a lot, right? And I talk to other folks as well. And, uh, you know, you think about engineering function, marketing function, sales, product, and so on. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, it, it's still a very relatively young product. The technology's been around. Um, but I've been very frustrated by one observation, and I don't know what you see the same. Um, but I, th this has resonated with, with some other folks that I've talked to is this anecdotal, but I'm not sure if it's data, but it's, ex it's the opposite of what I, what I would expect. My marketing team is like all over it. Okay. They're so much more productive. You know, today they write copies, you know, we can probably, uh, you know, reduce the marketing team to like one person or something. Uh, but, but guess which is the team that is using it the least for, to increase their productivity, at, at my company at least? Engineering. <laughs> are, are, are folks here seeing the same thing? Right? So, so there's something weird going on here. Uh, but let me sort of back up a little bit and try to go very quickly, give you a little bit of my background. So, you know, the words that I, that I choose to use and say have some meaning and relevance. Most recently, before you know, Roshan and I and other team members start the, 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 the most recent adventure, I was president of a unit at Panasonic Global on industrial AI, and that was through an acquisition. And so we worked on gigafactory, avionics, automotive, refrigeration, manufacturing robotics, and so on. You know, we were essentially trying to do predictive maintenance on a robot arm and using for example, a, a steel ring around it to detect EM waves coming off of it, and then try to do anomaly detection off of the waves. And uh, uh, I'll tell you how it went. Um, but you know, 10 years before that, actually many years before that, 10 years, okay. Uh, I was the first engineering director at Google that launched uh, you know, Gmail, Google Apps, right? And uh, you know, in between, I actually started a company uh, we'll call it digital enterprise AI or machine learning. The company was acquired by Panasonic. Uh, uh, many, many years ago, I started out in academia, right? I, I, all I wanted to do in my life up to that point was to become a professor, you know, IEEE fellow by a certain age and so on. So now I was, uh, essentially there was a startup university in Hong Kong, HKUST, and I ended up founding the computer engineering uh, department there, uh, you know, PhD from, from Stanford Semiconductor, Berkeley ECS back at the beginning, you know, of the, you know, when the first dot com domain was actually released. Uh, refugee uh, came to Silicon Valley back in 1979. And the reason I show you all of this is that uh, I want to tell you about a failure, 
right? And one of the first major failures I experienced was late in my career after the acquisition. Uh, Roshan, were you part of that already? Not yet. Yeah. But, okay. So he's not part of this failure. Uh, but we couldn't make machine learning work, right? Like, and, and I'm speaking that as coming in already an expert at this stuff, right? You know, Google, we were very proud of using ML many years ago, even for, for spam classification and so on. Um, and I was listening, I came in at the tail end of Daniela's talk, and there was talk about how there's not enough data and we need to have more data and so on. Essentially, that was, that was the wall that I ran into, that I never ran into at Google. Right? Because at Google, if you want more data for training, you write some lines of code, you launch it, and by evening you've got a hundred you know million dollar hundred million data points, and you know you throw algorithms at it, uh, and you know thinking that we can do the same thing at Panasonic. So, so that led to a big insight, but not immediately. Right? It was quite painful trying to do predictive maintenance, and and how many people here are familiar uh, with predictive maintenance? And how many have actually done it? And how many have done it using anomaly detection? You haven't done it. <laughs> because that's exactly what we did. Anomaly detection is not predictive maintenance, or at least it's not the full cycle. What anomaly detection does, and the reason we do that is because that's all we can do, right? And the reason we, uh, what we can do is anomaly detection will tell you, hey, I'm seeing something different today that I haven't seen before, okay? But what that is and what may fail or may not fail, that's your problem, that's not mine. So we did that, and then we launched it, uh, and I was on, working on this uh, global unit, then we launched it to the business division. Six months later, they came back very politely, and I can tell you all kinds of stories about working with, with great Japanese engineers. There's always two meetings, there's the meetings with me, and then there's the actual meeting afterwards. <laughs> and through, through later translation, with our, essentially our sponsor, who, who the, the, our, our handler uh, for, for the acquisition, I heard essentially say, Christopher, this is worse than nothing. It's not, it's not nothing, it's worse than nothing. Because what anomaly detection did was created a new workflow that says, hey, go figure out what this signal means. They already have a workflow to handle failures and, and so on, preventive maintenance and so on. Now we introduce this. And half of the time or more, depending on what we set the threshold, it's like somebody switched off uh, something or somebody put it in, 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 in maintenance or mode and so on. The signals are very, very noisy. And what people really want in the business side of things is that tell me whether this compressor is going to fail, even probabilistically, 80% chance in the next two weeks. And that is predictive maintenance. An anomaly detection doesn't do that. So that was, that was our, our failure coming from the digital world into the world that many of you are, are, are in. Manufacturing, you deal with physical devices and so on. And so the big insight was, was essentially to apply domain knowledge. Okay, that, that's, that's uh, I hope one day th when I say that, people will say, well, of course, right? But for us at least, and, and for most of the industry today, that is still not yet, of course. So anyway, that's an opportunity to launch a company, right? So knowledge first AI for industrials in particular. But I wanna highlight that it, it's, it's a problem <coughs> experienced largely in the physical domain that is not experienced in the digital domain. So the reason translation essentially is a solved problem is because it's, it's all just, it's all bits, right? Language, there's a lot of data for it. But predictive maintenance, uh, gigafactory manufacturing consistency and so on still has a lot of messy atoms that move at a million times slower and we can't generate data as much, right? I think that's one of the points that was made uh, at the end of the last presentation. And so we can't wait until, you know, atoms move faster or, or you know, three years later when you've collected enough data, then you've got a different piece of equipment in the field already. So you, we gotta solve the problem somehow. We live in the world that actually moves, and so we have to apply domain knowledge. Now, when we say to apply domain knowledge, 20, 30 years ago, when we were doing a lot of machine learning research around that, what that means is expert systems, and we're not gonna go back to that. But now, with ChatGPT, it, it's much easier for me and, 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 and Roshan to talk about, for people to imagine what systems we're actually building, right? So I can stop the talk here, and essentially say that, that essentially, what, what the problem that you're trying to solve 
can be solved if you find a way to, to apply domain knowledge and do it efficiently, right? Not, not, not write actual lines of individual code and then manage all the conflicts and so on. So around the same time, my friends at Google, and I still keep in touch with lots of folks at, at Brain, they were working on, of course, natural language understanding, NLU, you know, beyond NLP. And I was chatting with them, and I had insight into what was happening with the large language models work being, being worked on there. And you know, this, again, this, this loop now may seem obvious, or it's not, but, but the big insight that, that was that language is essentially knowledge, right, or knowledge representation. So when you train using language, you can end up I hope, that, I, I hope my use of the word knowledge is no longer controversial in terms of the embedded rep representations in these large language models. And so when you have this knowledge, there's a kind of understanding, right? I'm gonna say operational understanding. I don't really care you know, from a neuroscience point of view whether that's equivalent to human understanding, but clearly when you deal with models like ChatGPT, there is a, there is a, an apparent understanding. So that's something that was sort of the, the light bulb went up and said, I can use that. I can use the fact that machines can now understand me, understand the, the domain experts, and somehow translate that into code, into systems, into an integrated system, not just models, but entire systems to predict uh, failures. So, um, uh, uh, I'm gonna back out a little bit, right, and, and, and share perspective. We've all seen hundreds of representations of Industry 4.0, and, and these are the four. And I, I look at these things, and this is sort of version one for me, and it's, it's unsatisfying because it seems to be just more of the same, right? There, there's some, some break in technology that is not represented here, and so I kept looking, and there's one, the, Okay, that was sort of a trick. Do you see the, a, a key difference between this one and the previous one? Or well, at least the one that I care about. I'll go back. Here, okay, no, no, I'm, <laughs> never mind. The, the key word that changed here for me is autonomization, right? Uh, what is going to be very different from all the previous iterations, all the previous revolutions, is that there's, there's now a brain, right? There's autonomy, right? Um, there's planning, there's knowledge, there's understanding in these machines that we're building. Before, they were essentially just programmed to do exactly what we want them to do. And I don't just mean at the model level anymore, right? At the system level. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave a hook here that even that there's something missing, but I think that's quite enough for the industrial revolution that, that's happening. So how do we unlock this using you know, what I claim to be you know, one of the key things, domain knowledge, right? Domain knowledge coming from human being. And I wanna share this with you. It's, it's, um, um, if, if you plot uh, optimism or pessimism with technology, and then you know, I was curious enough, I said, well, what if we do that versus GDP per capita? Okay, kind of a wealth index, right? So there's no surprise here, right? Richer countries are much more excited about technology and, and poorer countries by, by GDP per capita are, are less optimistic or maybe even more, more pessimistic, right? Uh, now, Stanford uh, HAI, uh, do, of course, as you know, does an annual study uh, called the HAI Index, and they just released one in March, and that one has uh, quotes a, a study from Ipsos that asks about optimism with respect to AI in particular, and I think that was done about a, a year and a half ago. The survey, I mean. Uh, anybody wanna guess? It, no, two, two things, number one, is there a correlation? So, so I did the same thing. I also plotted that against GDP, GDP per capita. Um, first of all, do you think there's a correlation between GDP per capita and AI optimism? How many people think yes? How many people think no? You think no? You haven't seen this chart? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, we've got to talk. <laughs> okay, actually there's a correlation. Now the question, actually there's a stronger correlation than this, at least with that data. Um, my next question is, is the correlation in the same direction? How many people think it's the same direction? 
Okay, yeah, you're, you're right, because otherwise it would be interesting, right? Uh, it's very weird, look at this. Uh, and this is not my data, you know, this is just, uh, I, I just took the, the Ipsos um, study from Stanford uh, uh, AI report, this, at least in, in, in this case, and this is just GDP per capita, independent of the report, the, the trend line, uh, the R squared is 67%, right? Um, so we know there's correlation as to why we can just sit and wonder, right? Uh, but one of my uh, curiosities about this is, you know, again, is, is this also related to physical versus digital, right? Um, the, the surprise that we had with regard to the last two years of of large language, large foundation model, image, video, and so on, is that things that in conversation just five short years ago, some of my friends, VC friends in the Valley were saying, Christopher, how can creativity, how can initiative come from machines? And it turns out those are the very things that, that sort of fall first, right? In terms of, uh, of, of you know, generating images and so on. So that there may be something to do with high uh, productivity or, or um, a sort of high value societies where the marginal value of, of AI is gonna be a little bit less than say lifting up the, 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 the lower GDP countries. And I think that also correlates to physical versus digital. And so my interpretation here to folks in the manufacturing and, and physical industry is that I think AI, or this kind of AI, this wave of AI can actually make a much larger marginal difference in the industries that we are in. I say we because I am now, you know, fully physical industry, you know, I, I can talk manufacturing forever. Uh, than, than the marginal difference it can make in terms of the, the, of the digital industries. That's my interpretation, right? And, and so LLMs, the message I have here is that it's more than a tool, but it's less than a solution, right? And uh, I think at this point, I'm gonna ask, we, we were gonna do a live demo, but you know, we couldn't make the AV work, so I'm gonna ask uh, Roshan to talk through some of the screenshots, is that okay? Yep. All right, you got only like maybe two minutes. Yeah, I got you. Um, so yeah, like Christopher was saying, right? Now we have ChatGPT, it can do these forms of reasoning and thought that we think, we thought were restricted to the human domain or even creativity. I mean, I'm from a neuroscience background and to me creativity is just having enough neurons and throwing enough information at them over time. So when you've used ChatGPT, and luckily everyone here has, so I don't need to do a live demo of this, it can do amazing things, right? You can ask it to write up a quick document or a tutorial that you can then just copy and paste and send on and pretend it was your own work. Or you can get it to write up code that you could then copy and paste and send along and pretend it was your own work. Um, and that's great, it's wonderful but it still has so many drawbacks. And part of that is like Jeff was talking about earlier, there's just not enough tokens in the public domain for it to learn on. And some of it is there's knowledge that it just can't access. And that's what we end up seeing when we start asking it things, or we try and actually run the code that it ran, and we find out that it errors out because you know, it didn't test it. And it didn't realize that the libraries it was using has changed or when we ask it about something very specific to a company or an industry, like this is actually from one of our customers um, asking about you know, why there's location tags in the data set and why they don't make any sense. And GPT is gonna answer with 100% confidence and tell me absolute garbage. Um, because none of the things that it mentions in that description are at all what it was in my data set or what I was thinking about and it can't be, it can't possibly know that particular data set from this particular warehouse or company. It can't know who put it in there and why it was put in there. But as we kind of go forward into industry to make these things useful to people, to, to companies, we need systems that actually know their private proprietary knowledge and information. Because that's the only way that they're gonna get impact out of it. It's the only way they're gonna get value out of it. And more so, some people have seen the other issues, right? It can't criticize itself, it can't test. 
and they've started making steps in that direction. Right? We have autonomous agents. I don't know if anyone's played around with auto GPT. Um, has anyone here tried it out? Okay, less than chat GPT, but still a few. Auto GPT was actually amazing. It was a great idea right from the start where some, someone said, well, if I have an LLM that can make human speech, why don't I just get it to talk to itself to solve a problem, to achieve a goal? All right, I'm gonna tell it to come up with, well, up here, I gave it the goal, find the five best, best stocks to invest in today. And it said, all right, I'm gonna create an agent with a name, a role, and goals, and get it to think through this problem. Find out what steps it needs to take, take those actions, criticize itself, and then revise. And this is great, it can do amazing things, but it's not good enough for industry still, because this is still very limited. It's still very unreliable because I mean, it's just one LLM. It's just doing what it was made to do in the most general way possible. It's still guided by prompts that were created by uh, one person, right? Who was coding very fast to get this out in this kind of time. So what do we do about that? And how do we make a system like this that's industry grade? And that's really where we've been going as a company. And not just us, I mean, Sam Altman himself said the age of giant AI models is over, which is kind of big words coming from the creator of the giantest AI model of all, right? But what this means is now we have GPT-3, 3.5 turbo, GPT-4. These are giant models, they're great, they do all of these wonderful things, but now we need to specialize them into specific use cases. Right now on the internet, there are models like Vicuna, which is open source. There's papers coming out about using ChatGPT or GPT-4 to create smaller, more focused models that actually perform way better for specific tasks and then getting those systems to collaborate to achieve goals that they can't alone, right? You, why ask the same person to do all the things when I can you know, go ask my boss or my marketing team or someone at MIT. So in the 57 seconds available, I'll try to speed through the beginnings of the answers and uh, I'll, I'll be happy to, to talk, chat with you afterwards. Uh, I apologize that we didn't plan the time as well. Um, but I really, I really agree with Yan here. Uh, when, you know, he, he's, he's um, mis mis misunderstood as sort of trying to poo poo open AI and so on. And I've, maybe there's some aspect of that, but I think if you read everything that he says here, it's actually literally correct. And, and, the, and the guy is very intellectually honest, right? Um, Autoregressive LLMs, large language models are useful for writing aids, but they hallucinate too often. And I think he's written elsewhere that I hope I can say, that, you know, they make up shit, right? <laughs> uh, they have a very primitive understanding of the physical world, right? And because they don't, they, by themselves, they don't have sensors and actuators and embodied intelligence. Intelligence is really embodied intelligence, that's another. And they're very primitive planning capabilities, right? So, um, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip these slides, but somehow we've been working on these things and they have been working. And sort of the key thing here is an architecture that grounds these large language models as agents into the world. You, you don't expect your brain to essentially be hanging on the wall and, uh, you know, and, and say and know everything. There's data sources, there's sensors, there's actuators. That's where the truth is. I, I think the, the, any attempt to like make these, these models all knowing and super smart and have all the facts within them is inherently going to fail, right? And yet when you connect them as agents with other human beings, right? With, with machines, with sensors, actuated databases and build systems out of these things, they can plan, right? The, 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 uh, the, the sort of a chain of thought reasoning or even the conversations among these models together with humans are, pl are planning, right? Reasoning the way we, we humans reason, we essentially reason even explicitly or implicitly through the words, right? And so that's, that's the beginning of the reasoning through here. So when you hook up an entire system like this, and there's an architecture that we call COM, collaborative augmented language models, sorry. So language models, that, that's what we mean when we say they are more than a tool, but less than a solution. 
you're going to see emerging systems with architectures like the one that we're using here. And of course, the particular use case that we have is we use it as a virtual advisor for, for example, for field service personnel. The particular business problem there is there's way too few experts. They're retiring. We're losing their, their knowledge. And there's too many uh, people who need them. And so that if there's a virtual advisor in between that is connected to the world, that, that is embodied in the way that we're describing here, then they can actually solve real world problems today. All right? So there's a, a lot more interesting stuff, but I think I'm going to stop here for any Q&A. I think we have time for one question from the audience. Uh, you could have one sensor for the physical world to help inform your models in the information that gap in the game. Did I understand if, if I have one sensor for the physical world, what would it be? Well, first of all, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> right, I would take advantage of every sensor possible. I think sensors uh, actually are part of intelligence. It's intelligence without that context. Uh, I, so I haven't thought about that that uh, that question, right? Uh, but certainly, I know what it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be just language. You have one over there. Right. Um, could you talk about? Alignment and uh, safety, especially in complex cases like the ones you're dealing with, where you might have malls that are individually aligned, there's no guarantee that the agent that's built on top um, will be. Right. That, that's a great question in the context of the physical world. Uh, so the word alignment has many meanings, right? You know, a lot of people talk about the controversy with respect to open AI's alignment and so on. For us, um, so, for example, coming from a solutions point of view, what our customers want, we have two, two major things, right? We have an application, we call it AVIO, uh, Automatic Virtual Industrial Advisor. Uh, sorry, AVIA, AVIA. And then there's an AVIO, and the O is operator. And you can guess today which one is far more deployed. It's the advisor. Right? People say, operator, wait, wait, let, let, let the human push the button. So the minimum in alignment is the, that architecture that you saw earlier, I know I don't went through very fast, but the virtual agents interact with human agents as well. And our systems are built such that the human agent has to be the one that sort of presses the final button. So that's one example of, I would classify that under alignment. And other things are like sanity checks, Right, uh, and and these are very. Um, are, are, is your background computer science or? Okay, uh, I'm I'm partly guilty of of this, right? You know, once I'm part of Panasonic, we we realize these people have been working in human safety systems forever, and all these computer scientists are coming and say, "Oh, you got to be careful." It's like, what do you, what the hell are you talking about, right? <laughs> so, so what I'm trying to say is, you know, we talk about alignment and things like that from a computer science point of view. But there's a lot of that, in t that, that experience that's already built into the automotive industry, in the, in the, the, you know, the aeronautics industries, and so on, that I think we can really learn from right? and, and make that part of what we think of as alignment. All right, thank you so much, Rashawn and Christopher. Thank you.